In a world where trust is the thin line separating safety from horror, we are sometimes left to face the reality that emerges when parents unknowingly leave their children in the clutches of evil. The comforting facade of familiar faces can mask the darkest intentions, turning a caregiver into a monster. As unsuspecting parents go about their daily lives, their innocent little ones fall victim to a sinister force, their lives forever altered, never to be the same when their children are left in the wrong hands and every parent's biggest fear becomes reality. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Tell Me Darling, where I tell my husband Phil true crime stories. I am Jess. I'm Phil. And we're your hosts. <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong with you today? <laughs> oh no, I really oh. need to like figure that shit out, the opening. It oh. gets me every week, like well, I don't know what to say. Just but open. Just what? Just open it up. Okay, let's yeah. open it up. Anyway, I am excited to be back for another week. I actually look forward to like recording these now. At yeah. the start... I was so nervous mm-hmm. that I didn't, but now I do. Yeah. I look forward to like telling that's you. That's cool. Me it's, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I look forward to just sitting down and hanging out with you. Oh, that's cute. I look forward to the stories, but I look yeah. forward to hanging out. Okay. Cool. Well, <laughs> cool. I'm, <laughs> I'm just trying to keep it moving because I felt yeah, like yeah, yeah, last yeah. week there was keep a lot it, of... Keep rolling. A lot of pauses. Yeah, let's go. Keep rolling. Anyway, um, I wanted to start off by just thanking everyone for listening to our podcast. It's really surreal to like have people like commenting on our Instagram page and just like on our YouTube and just like people like uploading photos, tagging us like with our podcast picture on like their car stereo. Like it's mm. really cool and it just like... Yeah, it's just exciting that we're yeah. like here because I feel like I've talked about doing this podcast for a really long time. Like it yeah. took so long to actually like get off the ground. Yes. But we're finally here mm-hmm. and yeah, we're uploading, uploading episodes, which is exciting. Um, yeah. But I would like to take this opportunity to ask people to jump over if you're not listening on Spotify or wherever you're listening to give us a five star review because it's super helpful for new podcasts. I don't think that we're, <laughs> I don't think that we're at a five star level yet, but maybe two and a half. I think we'll get there. So it's kind of like <laughs> you guys are like investing in us by giving us five stars to start off with. You know, mm. you know what I mean. Yeah. But less than five stars isn't really going to help our podcast grow. So <laughs> I don't know how it all works. It doesn't just grow by people listening. Well, the more stars, the more it pops up in. Yeah, I think it like just gives it a better chance oh, of like popping cool. up to new people. I'm not really sure how it works. I'm just going off what people say in other podcasts that yeah. I listen to. They always say five star review or like follow us or subscribe on YouTube. All of that jazz. We appreciate it. It's cool. very helpful. Watch on YouTube as well. Watch on YouTube. Yeah. Listen on Spotify in the car, then go home and, and then put it on YouTube. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, so something else I wanted to talk about, which is actually not great news it's pretty mm, sad yeah. um, but this week we seen on instagram that our favorite podcast our favorite true crime podcast wife of crime have been going through a rough time mm. russ who is jess's husband um had an accident on his bike mountain biking and it's left him paralyzed from the waist down which is so sad and so scary and we're just thinking of them. And yeah, I just like have been thinking about that all week. It just feels like really weird because you feel like you know them like when you yeah. listen to them every week. So I feel like it's like a friend that's like hurt themselves and I just can't stop thinking about them. But they do have a GoFundMe page linked on their Instagram, which is Wife of Crime Pod. Um, so if you can donate just to help, they have to change their whole lives basically like they have to like move because the house that they live in now doesn't like cater to wheelchairs and like Russ is going to a treatment center that's a bit far away so like Jess has to relocate 
and it's just like really sad so if you can donate make sure you head to their page and yeah give them a little donation i donated what i could but you know just hopefully Mm. anything extra helps yeah yeah anything to say there um no sad it is sad and you it's right you feel like you do know them yeah um I was, yeah, I can't stop yeah. thinking. Like, that's just such a huge... It's not like he just broke his leg. You no, know? He's like yeah. paralyzed from the waist down. Mm. Anyway, we're thinking of them. Yeah. Um, moving on to some more positive news from last week. Uh-oh. Not uh-oh. Oh, uh, yeah. Whoa-ho. Uh-huh. I got Taylor Swift tickets. Oh. Oh, my God. What an <laughs> ordeal that was, uh, wasn't it? That was, yeah. We went away last week. I was like, Phil, we should go away for school holidays. Firstly... Big mistake. We shouldn't have done that. It started off really chaotic. I'm not going to say why, but it sucked. First day, sucked. Second day was Taylor Swift release day. And I jumped on my computer at 9 a.m. Tickets went on sale at 10. So I'm in there an hour early. I was like, I just want to be like prepared along with the rest of Australia and New Zealand and whoever else. And I even said to Phil, like, this won't take long, a couple of hours, max, like one to two hours. Like when I bought Justin (laughs) Bieber tickets, I was in and out in 15 minutes. Like I had VIP 15 minutes. So I was really hopeful. Anyway, 10 o'clock comes, I get in the line. Everyone's watching the blue line go past. 11 o'clock comes. Hectic. 12 o'clock comes. For me. 1 o'clock comes. And then 1.30 comes and Sydney sells out. She's sold out. So I'm like, well, fuck, I just wasted three hours there. Better jump to Melbourne at two o'clock for their launch. Sat there from 2 to 6 p.m. So I'm nine hours deep at this point And no, like, I'm just not getting in. And I'm seeing people, like, jump on. And then in 10 minutes, they're, like, let through the lounge and, like, buying tickets. So I was like, this just isn't going to happen to me. Like, I've been sitting here for nine long hours. I've missed the first day of our holiday feel like I can tell I was frustrated at this point because he's been like I've just ditched him with the three kids I'm like I can't move I have to stay here I live here now anyway lucky I love my kids and had the best time hanging out with them yeah, so they actually did have a ball I was, was like jealous you that missed out I missed out yeah but at six o'clock I called it I was like I can't it's been nine hours I'm not getting tickets and mm. I logged out and then at 6 30 one of my friends sent me a link I don't know how and I don't know where it came from but she said, click this link and buy tickets. And I was like, okay, I'll try. Like I've been here all day. Click the link. Didn't work. Click the link again. Didn't work. Copied and pasted the link in a new browser. And I went straight through into the purchasing page. I was shaking at this point because I'm like, oh my God, the timer starts. I'm on my phone. I don't have my visa card. We're not at home. So I'm like, even if I get these tickets in my cart, how am I going to check out? So I'm like shaking. I'm like switching between like the Ticket Tech app and the my Combank app so I can copy and paste my card details. <laughs> and finally. <laughs> Just get to the point, mate. You got tickets at the end of the day. Who cares? Tickets. Everyone cares. This is important oh. information. Okay. This was a survivor story. <laughs> <I'm> and I, <laughs> I hell, survived mate. the great Taylor oh. Swift war. And yeah, I got two tickets. Hooray. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> well, honey, I'm, I'm happy for you. That's so rude. You don't no, understand. I, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I don't. No, I don't. I honestly don't. So understand. many people missed out. It's very sad. Oh. Well. well, thank you so much for your support. It's glad I'm glad to see <laughs> how you feel. And I will not be taking Phil with me. Mate, just watch it live on TV. It's all good. They don't play it live on TV. They'll, they'll, be, a, they'll be on YouTube in like a couple of days after. Okay. Surround sound system. It's sweet. LeBron James is coming. He's playing a basketball game. Yeah. Are you going to get tickets or are you just going to watch it live? I'll watch it live. Oh, as if In the comfort not. of my own home. Okay, please. No people. I don't like being around people. <laughs> That's a lie. I do like people. All right. Well, you've got the floor. Quickly get out. Anything you want to share? Because last week you fucking rambled. No, I'm not doing a ramble. Just um, I built a back fence. Me and Levi um, built the back fence, put the chain wire on. It's looking real good. Um, apart from that, what are you doing, mate? She's just, if you're not watching and just listening to this, she's spilt coke all over herself. Um, No, nothing else to share, really. Built a back fence this last week. Yeah. And just working hard. Yeah. So boring. (laughs) Let's get into the story. (laughs) I'm ready. Are you ready to hear it? Yep. Okay. Before I start, just based on this, okay, yep. um, I just want to say that this case is not very well covered at all. Mm hmm. In, in the leading up to 
whatever. A lot of the newspaper articles from this particular case um, are like after. Okay. Like after information. There's not, so I don't know a lot about the people in this case and who they were leading up to this event. If I don't, that makes I don't sense. follow because doesn't all the information normally come after something yeah, happens? Like I'm saying like sometimes like cases are like really well covered that like you find out a lot about who the people were as okay. people and like their life story and what got them. I don't know a lot of that information. Yeah. So if you throw like curveball questions at me, asking me where they went to primary school and what shoe size they are, I won't know those answers. Well, you know they're going to be coming now. Okay. So. Well, I'm excited to not answer them. Kidding. All right. Would you like to hear it? I'm ready. Tell me, darling. Thank you. It was the 31st of July, 2018. Oh, and not that long ago. Not that long ago. It's recent. And Heather Lynn Gardner and Jamie, I want to say Zion, it's X-I-O-N-G, but I couldn't find anyone that actually said it out Let's loud. Let's just go, Jamie. Jamie Zion, he's of um, Asian background. Mm -hmm. Jamie is, Heather isn't. Had welcomed their second child into the world, a beautiful baby boy named Benson. He was seven pounds and five ounces and 21 inches long. Benson slotted right into the family as if he had always been there. He had a huge head of dark hair and beautiful brown eyes. He was a very easy baby, always smiling. He loved being tickled and taking car rides. He was very loved by his mum and dad and big brother, Jathan. What's big brother's name? Jathan. Jathan. J-A-I-T-H-Y-N. Different. It's like Jason yeah. with yeah. a lisp. Yeah. And where, where are we? Where are we located? So the family lived in Wausau. Wisconsin. Yeah. You've been to America. Am I saying that right? Oh, uh, yeah. I didn't go there. Wisconsin. Yeah. And we're just your normal happy family. So it's the 18th of October, just a couple of months after Benson was born and Heather had returned to work and was getting ready for another shift. Mm -hmm. She got the kids ready and dropped them off at her babysitter's house, Marissa Teetsort, at around 3.30 that afternoon. Dropped them off at 3.30 in the afternoon? Mm-hmm. And it's a, home, it's a home daycare, is it? It's, yeah, just at this lady's house. There's a lot of home daycares in America, isn't there? Yes. Do we have lots here or many here? I know um, there's some, but yeah, not we as do, many. Yeah, we do, but it's very regulated. structured and regulated yeah. here. Whereas this is more just like a casual babysitting. I wouldn't say it's like a home daycare. Ooh. It's not a home daycare business. It's it's a ba They call it a babysitter. Damn. Yeah. They um, put so all my she kids drops, in one of them. She drops the kids off at around 3.30 that afternoon. Mm -hmm. So Heather's grandmother would usually babysit the children, but she had recently moved to California and Marissa was recommended through a co-worker of Heather's. Heather knew of Marissa. She was from the same town she was and she too had a baby. So it seemed fine that she babysat. Just quickly. Yeah. Um, what does, is it Heather? Mm -hmm. What does Heather do for work if she's going to work that late in the afternoon? Is she like a nurse, hospital work? Some sort no, of shift I, work I couldn't she... find out what her job was at the time, but like a couple of jobs she's had since is like kind of restaurant, like hospitality. Okay, okay yeah, so makes sense. So being that time, I think it could be similar, yep. but I couldn't specify. Mm -hmm. um, so Heather drops the two kids off as normal and leaves for work. So at 5.57 p.m., Heather receives a text message from Marissa. That's the babysitter? The babysitter telling her that her details had been posted on an online news source because she had just recently been charged with child abuse. She then asked Heather not to tell anyone that she was watching her kids because she legally wasn't allowed to be. Hello, red flags. Well, hang on. Whoa, 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 hang on. Marissa has texted Heather, the mum, the mum, saying, Hey, just letting you know, um, my details have just been posted online on this news article um, telling people that I've been charged with child abuse. Oh, yep. Just so you know, don't let anyone know that I'm watching your kids because I'm oh, not allowed. Damn, I'll be, see you later work, got to go. You'd think so. Yep. So it wouldn't be until 9.20 p.m. that mm -hmm. Heather would make her way to Marissa's house with her sister Jessie to pick up the children. As Heather and Jessie walked to the door, Marissa was already there waiting with the children ready to hand them over at the door, which Heather and Jessie found strange because usually Heather would go inside and help pack up the kids' things and get the nappy bag ready. But it was late and dark, so she grabbed Benson, who was sleeping in the baby carrier, tucked in a nice snug blanket with his beanie covering his eyes and the other children and got them into the car and off they went. Uh-huh. 
So they go to the local laundromat because Heather wanted to finish up on some washing she had started earlier and Jesse was helping her. So Jesse is walking around with the toddler, brother Jathan, while Heather is doing the laundry. Who's Jesse again? Heather's sister. Okay. When did she come into this? She went with Heather to pick up the okay, children. Okay, yeah, yeah. I did say that. Mm-hmm. She puts Jathan down and goes to check on Benson, who still hadn't stirred at this point. She pulls Benson's beanie back and immediately notices that he doesn't look right. His lips are pursed together and look unusual. She calls for Heather. Heather pulls back the blanket more and realises that he's blue and ice cold to the touch. Heather instantly rips Benson out of the carrier. He's stiff and almost hard. She lays him down on the table and begins CPR while Jesse frantically calls 911. Fuck. So I'm going to play you the 911 call and we'll insert the clip as well. Who was that? Was that, that the older brother crying in the background? Yeah, Jathan. Yeah. So intense, really intense. But I have to say, I feel like the nine one one operator did a really good job on that call, mm. considering we listened to like Bree and Kaylee, yeah. where they weren't so great. Um, so Heather is trying her best to do CPR on Little Benson, and it's not long before officers arrive on scene and quickly take over. The police officers continue to perform CPR on Benson until the ambulance arrives, but unfortunately, once they do arrive, they realise there's nothing that they can do for him and he is officially declared as deceased. So, as you can imagine, Heather is beside herself, she's crying and visibly upset, and the police officers straight away are trying to figure out what's happened. How, like, did they get here? Was this an accident? Could it be SIDS? They just want to know... What happened to two-month-old baby boy Benson? So Heather explains that they had only just picked Benson up from the babysitter, Marissa Teetzort, and when they checked on him just now, he was blue and cold. While this is happening, Detective Jennifer Holes arrives on scene and gets ready to interview Heather and Jesse. But before the interview can start, Jesse, Heather's sister, lets Detective Holes know that in the midst of the chaos, she texted Marissa on Heather's phone. She said to Detective Holes, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have done it, but I texted her and said, you killed my sister's baby. Detective Holes asked Jessie what Marissa said back, and Jessie said that she didn't say anything. The message appeared to be left unread, so they weren't sure whether Marissa had read the text or not. So Detective Holes asks 
Heather and Jessie to recount what happened that night from when they arrived to pick the children up. She asked Heather and Jessie if they both went inside and Heather says, no, she didn't even let us inside. She met us out the door. Marissa handed her the baby and the diaper bag and the next thing the door was shut and we were leaving. Mm. So it was a really quick exchange. Marissa was at the door ready to give the children back. And Jessie tells Detective Holes that she noticed at the time that Marissa's face was unusually red. She said she even thought like in her mind, oh, like what the hell is she on? Like it really stood out to her at the time. Red as in like working out red or like, like red as red, in like, tried to wash blood off red? No, no, no. Just a red face. She said yeah. like she had a beet, mm-hmm. red, beetroot red face. No blood. Yeah. So now usually Marissa would say to Heather, okay, what time tomorrow or see you tomorrow. But there was none of that during this brief handover. No yep. talk of the next day, which at the time Heather didn't think anything of. But now looking back, obviously that's red, a red flag if like it gives everyone a reason to believe that maybe this wasn't an accident yep. and something far more sinister had occurred. Detective Holes asked Heather what she saw and noticed when picking the kids up and Heather told her again, you know, Marissa was at the door. Adam, who was Marissa's boyfriend, was sitting on the couch. She didn't really pay much attention to him. It was dark and only the TV was on. Nothing seemed unusual other than the odd front door exchange. Does this lady, did she look after other kids as well? Uh, was it just previously but not at this time she just had her child Mm -hmm. and the heather's kids yeah okay so it wasn't like she has like multiple kids there at a time like five ten kids at a time that she'd normally look after so she wasn't like a registered daycare she was just babysitting Mm -hmm. um and like she'd only been babysitting heather's kids for two weeks she's very new So, after speaking with Heather and Jessie, it was clear that Detective Holes needed to speak with Marissa to get to the bottom of this. She made her way over to Marissa's apartment that she shared with her boyfriend and the father of her children, Adam. Detective Holes wasn't really sure what to expect upon arrival, especially since Jessie, Heather's sister, had texted her about Benson's death. She arrived at the apartment alongside Captain Grain and the other officers and knocks on the door, but there's no answer. She yells out to Marissa and says, we're not going away, open the door. But the door remained closed and silent. And then a runner? Well, the officers decide to break through the door and when they walk in, they can see that the apartment is empty. No one is home. Hmm. So straight away, Detective Holes manages to get in touch with Marissa's service provider for her phone and track where she is. And they track her to a local hotel called The Plaza, which sounds fancy, but it certainly isn't. It's like one of those like dingy motel places where everyone's stores are like attached to a shared balcony, like in the movies. Yeah. You know, like it's like that. So within an hour, Detective Holes, Captain Graham and officers are standing outside of Marissa's hotel door. They knock on the door a few times when Adam, Marissa's boyfriend, opens the door and he's dazed. He appears to just woke, to have just woken up And straight away, he's like, what are you guys doing here? Detective Holes asks him if Marissa is there and makes her way inside. All right. Mm -hmm. She pushes through the door and says, we're coming in. Pretty much. Yeah, walks in. As you would. Yeah. All right. Caught up? Yep. No questions. Um, I'm all caught up. Hoping they get to the bottom of this and shoot her. Wow. (laughs) You don't even know what happened. Well, she's done something to the baby. Everything's sus. Okay. So Adam appears frustrated and confused as to why the police are there. He starts accusing them of harassment and says to them, she's already been charged. We will be in court. Why are you here? What? And Detective Holes is like, well, actually, we have to talk to her about something new. And Adam's like, what's something new? So Marissa is sleeping in the bed and Detective Holes starts trying to wake her up. And while she's doing that, she's also talking to Adam and she asks him, you know, like, why are you guys here? Mm. And Adam says, because we wanted to get away. And she's like, from what? And he's like, everything. What is it against the law to come stay at a hotel room for the night? So Marissa finally wakes up and gets up and Detective Holes takes her outside to talk away from Adam. Yep. As Detective Holes begins talking to Marissa, she's calm and unbothered, almost as if she doesn't really know why the police are there. Detective Holes asked Marissa about her day and specifically about taking care of Benson that day. And Marissa says to Detective Holes, I was just taking care of him and he was fine. And in the police video footage, when you hear her say that, her voice elevates on the word fine, 
which almost sounds like she's asking a question, which gives off the impression that Marissa isn't actually sure about what she's saying. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't, the way that they interpret that is she doesn't actually know if he's fine because she says it as if she's asking a question. As if she didn't and watch him or... No, as if like she said that he's fine, yeah. but she does. She's not really not believing sure what she's saying. Yep. Subconsciously. Yep. She doesn't believe what she's saying. Yeah. Yep. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if she was like, "He's fine." Yeah. Like that's firm. Mm-hmm. So Detective Holes asked Marissa to tell her the movements of the day and what happened from the time Benson was dropped off to the time he was picked up. Yep. So this is how the afternoon went, according to Marissa. When the children first arrive, they go outside for a little bit because it's a nice day out, and then they come inside. Marissa feeds Benson, and then she put him in the pack and play, which is kind of like a porter cut, and he goes to sleep. She had a baby monitor camera set up so that she could see him, and at 6.30pm, Adam arrives home from hunting, which is where he'd been that day. A little after Adam got home, they were hungry, so they packed the kids up into the car Benson in his carrier seat and they went to a nearby McDonald's. Mm -hmm. They went inside for about 15 minutes while they ate. There's video footage of this. Okay. Kids are all well during this time in the video footage? Yeah, everyone's there. Mm -hmm. She gave Benson a bit of his bottle and then they left and went back home. Apparently, this is her story. They put a movie on once they got home and then Heather called Marissa to say that she was putting her clothes in the dryer and that she would be there to pick them up, pick up the kids soon. 15 minutes later, Heather and Jesse arrived, pick up the kids and they leave. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So while talking to Detective Holes, Holes, Marissa is smiling and happy. She genuinely just seems unbothered or like they're talking about something else. Yep. She hasn't once asked, you know, what is this about? What are you guys doing here? Is Benson okay? Like, why are you asking me about Benson? None of that. Mm -hmm. Which feels like a little sus, don't you think? Like, she's almost like trying to play it cool. Yeah, the whole whole thing's sus. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you going to a motel at 9.30 at night after you've just finished babysitting? You think straight away, I'll be wrecked and going straight to bed. Yeah, they didn't check into the hotel till 10 to 10. So, nearly 10 o'clock at night. Okay. So... Finally, Detective Holes tells Marissa, you know, the reason that we're here is because Benson is dead. He's died. And Marissa's face immediately goes from like happy smiley to kind of like scrunched up. And she says, why is he dead? And begins to cry. But it's kind of like... Like a fake? Yeah. She's like, why is he dead? Like literally, like that's her face and voice. It's It feels very fake. Yeah. Detective Holes tells Marissa, well, we were hoping that you could shed some light on that. Or she asks her, I should say. Mm -hmm. Um, And immediately Marissa denies knowing anything or having any idea what happened to Benson. But Detective Holes isn't buying it. Marissa keeps saying, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why he's dead. And Detective Holes says, you need to tell me what happened. You didn't tell me last time. I need you to tell me the truth this time. Oh, man. That's hectic. So, was this the same detective that would have charged her for the inappropriate or whatever she was charged for last time? Yes. So, this is not Detective Hull's first time dealing with Marissa. Fuck. Well, then she she should know straight away. Know what? That she's done something. Well, she's very... You just... You think. Yeah. No questions. Get in the car. We're going, you're going to jail. Well, she needs to try and straight find out what happened to Benson. And I think she's trying to do it with like an empathetic approach. To yeah. try and get Marissa to talk. She obviously knows Marissa. She's dealt with her in the past. So she probably knows how Marissa works in a sense. You know what I mean? Anyway, so the reason Detective Holes says this is because this isn't the first time Marissa has been accused of child abuse, which we know because of the text that she sent Heather earlier that day. It also- And that's just alarm bells. Why would you send that to the... Obviously, why would you send that to the kid's mum that you're looking after? Because she didn't want Heather to tell anyone that she was babysitting because she was charged with child abuse and one of the terms is that she is not to babysit children. And if she violates that, she's basically violating a term of her whatever. Then she gets in in trouble. Yes, she goes to jail. Mm. So 
It wasn't the first time yep. she'd been charged and it also wasn't even the second time. The fuck? It was actually the third time. What did she do the first two times? So two months earlier, Detective Holes was called to Marissa's home after a child she was babysitting sustained severe head and face injuries. The child's parents reported Marissa, obviously, so there was an investigation. Marissa claimed it was an accident, but given her history, the officers investigating the incident weren't so mm-hmm. sure. Marissa claimed that the, ch- the child had fallen off the couch and Adam, her boyfriend, was fairly adamant that that's what had happened. He wasn't there during the incident, but he says to investigators, she has no reason to lie to me. Adam tells them that the Marissa was in the bathroom when the child who was on the couch fell off. She immediately pulls up her pants and runs to check on the child who was crying. He says Marissa loves kids and she wouldn't beat a kid up. There's just no way. But when officers asked Marissa for the details on what happened that day, her story was completely different. Marissa tells them that she was babysitting. The child went to bed, so she started to clean. And whilst doing the dishes, she heard the baby screaming. So she stopped what she was doing and went to check on her. And that's when she found her on the floor beside the couch amongst a bunch of toys. So basically implying that the baby fell off the couch and probably hit some toys on the way down. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Adam, who just told a very different story, is standing right there and his face looks very concerned. Either he lied and he's now feeling nervous about it or he's realizing in the moment that Marissa's lied to him about what actually happened Uh, or she's lying now. Is he sus at all? Do we have any reason to be sus at all? Well, either way, his face drops and you can see a change. So he doesn't actually know what happened. He wasn't there. So in the moment, you can see his face drop because he's he's thinking either she lied or she's lying now. Either way. She's lied. This isn't what she told me. Mm -hmm. And he looked silly because he's just, she wasn't, sorry, she wasn't there at the time when he, the police officers first got there, investigated. So he's like, no, this is what happened. She would never do that. Really Mm -hmm. like had her back. And then she's come home and told this completely different story in front of him. And he's like, well, fuck. Yeah. So, and yeah. (laughs) So, and yeah, English. And just to add to Marissa's character and kind of paint a picture about her love for children, Marissa and Adam have five children together. What the fuck? And four of them have been taken away from them and put into child protective services. The only reason their fifth baby hadn't been taken away from them is because CPS didn't even know he existed and oh that my God. he was there and they're pregnant with their six. Oh, fucking hell. Crazy. Just grubs. Well... Yes, no, no, but no. fucking grubs. Just and this is why you don't. Sorry, I'm going off. This is why you don't ever put your kids somewhere with someone you don't know, mate. Well, yeah, that's fair. Um, but I think I I have to say, like all of this, Adam's not a great person, but mm. he's never been charged with child abuse. Yeah, he's never been charged. That doesn't mean you're not a. That doesn't mean you haven't done something. There is like a part in the video camera where he says, um, I'll, I'll tell you later actually. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he's never been charged. Yep. She has. So back to October 18th, the night of Benson's death. Marissa is still denying knowing what happened to Benson. She keeps saying, I don't know what happened. I promise you, I don't know while crying. However, no tears are actually falling from her eyes. Meanwhile, inside officers are asking Adam to recount his steps for that evening. He tells officers he got home around 6.30 and they decided to go to McDonald's. He tells them he picked Benson up out of the pack and play and put him in the car seat and that he seemed normal, whiny even. Outside, Marissa is still speaking with officers. She says to them, I would never kill a baby. And Captain Grayton says, maybe it's not something you did. Maybe it's something you didn't do. Almost trying to give her like a way to tell the truth without casting blame on her. Mm Mm-hmm. The officers suggest maybe it was an accident. Maybe she left him alone too long. And Marissa says, I left him in the pack and play with the camera thingy. I didn't check on him because I had the camera. So we're finally getting somewhere. She's finally starting to open up a little bit. Captain Graham asks her, when did you realize he was dead? And Marissa just shrugs her shoulders. Finally, she tells them that she checked on Benson just before Adam got home. And that's when she realized he was dead. He was lying on his belly and felt cold to the touch. She doesn't check for a pulse or to see if he was breathing. 
she doesn't try to do CPR. <sighs> Actually, when Captain Graham asks if she did CPR, she laughs and says, no, I don't even know how to do that. Anyway, so she doesn't do CPR. Instead, she picks him up, dresses him in his snowsuit, puts him in the car carrier and takes him to McDonald's with the other children and Adam, who thought Benson was just sleeping. So the whole time she's at McDonald's, Benson is already dead the fuck? in the car seat. And Adam doesn't know. Mm. And neither do the other, the other kids. And actually in the video, a lady like walks past and says something to her and Marissa kind of laughs. Or I, I'm assuming it's something like, oh, you've got your hands full or something like that. And she laughs. Meanwhile, he's dead. So yeah, that's just, it's, yeah. Okay. Is that, is that the truth though? He was dead. He was dead. At like McDonald's. He was a oh, Yeah. Yes. So Detective Holes is like, okay, so you knew he was dead when you went to McDonald's. You knew he was dead when his mum came and picked him up. Did you not think that Heather would notice, like, Mm. his mother? And Marissa is like, yeah, I thought she would, but... And then says nothing, just shrugs her shoulders. So what police officers are trying to work out now is who was lying, Heather or Adam? Because they both have different stories. Adam says, you know, like, he picked him up and Heather's like, no, he was already dead. Yep. So police officers finally ask Adam for the truth. Like, come on, why are you here? We all know why you're here at the hotel. And Adam is like, no, I don't. And the police officers say, because Benson is dead. Like, you're trying to get away. Yep. And Adam's face, like, drops. Like, it just turns, like, pale. Mm-hmm. His voice trembles while he's trying to explain why they're at the hotel. And he had no idea about Benson. Damn. And it seems genuine. Yeah. This is all on the police body cam footage, yep. so you can see it. So when officers ask Marissa what Adam knew, she says nothing. Like, he didn't know anything. Mm-hmm. He is, like, whatever he's saying inside right now is to protect her and that Benson was dead before Adam got home. When police officers tell Adam what Marissa admitted to, he's shocked. He says, she knew? Like, why didn't she tell me? She knew the whole time. Yep. Like, he really didn't know. So after speaking with both of them, they realise Marissa is the only one who really knows what happened here. They take Marissa back to her apartment and ask her to reenact re-enact how she found Benson so that they can get a better understanding of what might have occurred. Mm-hmm. They give Marissa a doll and ask her to demonstrate exactly how Benson was positioned when she found him. Marissa's behaviour throughout this process was really strange. She was laughing and smiling, which is wild. Like she ain't all there, is she? Given Something the wrong with her. All there in the head? No, she's perfectly sane. But it's like it's like she's trying to like like just play it cool, like like nothing's wrong. Like but she's overcompensating by like smiling and laughing. Like it's she's not really like She's not comprehending like the gravity this, of the situation. Yeah. yeah. This is sure. She's not all there. It's just she puts the baby on his belly face down, the pretend belly, mm-hmm. baby. And whenever the detective is like, are you sure he was like this? Was his head like this? Or was he lying this way? She's just kind of like, I think so. And I think it was almost as if she's like making it up as she goes along. Yep. Then she says she picked him up, realized he was really cold and dead. So she lays him down on the floor dresses him in his snowsuit and then puts him in the car seat with a blanket over top and leaves him in the bedroom. Adam comes home and then, you know, the rest. They go to McDonald's. So detectives start asking her about the baby monitor again because during her first interview, she kept talking about the baby monitor and how she was watching him through that and that's why she thought he was fine. And the detective was like, okay, um, so like, can you tell me why it's unplugged right now? And points to the baby monitor, which is unplugged from the wall. It's Mm. not on and it's not in use. Yeah. And she's like, oh, is it? And then she's like, maybe I unplugged it too. So finally, after gathering all the info that they need, Marissa is arrested. Not for Benson, because they're not sure. Mm -hmm. But she's arrested for the other other child. and, and And looking after babysitting when she's not meant to be babysitting. Um, I'm not sure about that, but she's technically arrested for the charge of the previous okay. one, yep. which is how they got her to jail, basically. Yep. So finally, after gathering all the info that they need, Marissa is arrested, taken to the police station and spends the night in jail. Good. 
off the streets. Yeah. On the 20th of October, a day and a half later, Detective Holes and Captain Crane return to interview Marissa again. But this time they come with news. Benson's autopsy results had come back and they were not what anyone was expecting. Uh-oh. The cause of Benson's death was blunt force trauma. He had at least three separate blunt force trauma injuries to his head. He also had a fracture to his tailbone. The tailbone was fractured, broken off and displaced, indicating that a significant amount of force was used. Because of this, his death was immediately ruled a homicide. Did she drop him? We don't know. Yeah, well, I'll get to that. Okay. What happened, but... That's a lot. Yeah. You know, that's a lot. So when the interview starts, Marissa sticks to her story of not knowing what happened to Benson. She's still denying knowing anything. And Detective Holes and Captain Graham, who is a male. Yeah. I don't know if I mentioned that. Are kind of, I guess, extending an arm. And they're asking her, like, was it Adam? Was it an accident? Did you accidentally drop him? Mm -hmm. Because at this point, they still really don't know what happened. And she's, and she's not giving anything up. Nothing. She's Fuck. playing it very hard. Yeah. They just want to know what happened to Benson. So Marissa suddenly says, you know, maybe he hit his head on the arm of the lounge. And Graham was like, how? Did you hit his head too? Like when you sat down? And Marissa says, I don't know, maybe. And then Holes asks her to show like how she put him on the couch. And Marissa just like, puts her arms out and just like does this like it's just like nothing she like mimics putting something down Mm -hmm. but her story doesn't make sense and detective holes and captain graham aren't buying it benson received serious blunt force trauma enough that it killed him so placing him down on a soft couch isn't an explanation that's going to stand what did you fucking do and then marissa says maybe i put him down like this and gently moves her arms again the same as she did before and then she says, I didn't throw him. I could never. She fucking threw him. And Detective Holes straight away is like, well, that's an interesting statement. Because nobody even suggested that Marissa threw Benson. Nobody even said the word through. Marissa yeah. did that all on her own. So Detective Holes asked Marissa if she threw Benson. And of course, Marissa says, no, I could never. So after a lot of back and forth between Marissa and detectives... Holes pleads with Marissa. She says, you know, as a mother, you would want to know what happened to your child in their final moments of their life. Please let me give that to Heather. Please. Marissa sits in silence for two minutes before she finally starts to talk. So it's very clear. It's very clear in these two minutes that she's really trying to think about what she's going to say next. Is there more excuses? A lot of... She really holds on to this idea of that she didn't do anything. Again, she denies, denies, denies. But Detective Holes is like, enough. Just tell us the truth. Like yeah. she, you can tell she's like, I kind of getting, getting off fed now. off. Yeah. Finally, Marissa says that she threw Benson into the pack and play. And Captain Graham is like, okay, so did you roughly place him or did you throw him or did you drop him? And Detective Holes asks Marissa to show her exactly what happened. Mm. And she says to Marissa, you know, tell me what happened. And if it adds up with his injuries, then I know I have a sorry, caring person here. She's basically basically trying to empathize with her and make her feel like less of a monster. Okay. But this is a tactic. Yep. And Detective Holes is very smart and she knows what she's doing. Okay, good. Marissa finally opens up. She tells Detective Holes and Captain Graham that she had become frustrated with Benson. She walked up to the pack and play with Benson in her hands and forcefully threw him in. She then told Captain Graham that Benson hit his head on one of the hard plastic corners in the corner Mm -hmm. before landing face down. Captain Graham asked Marissa to stand up and show him how she did it, basically reenacting the throw. Marissa then tells them Benson cried for a couple of seconds and then stopped. Marissa looks closer at Benson and that's when she realized he was dead. She picks him up and puts him face down in the middle of the pack and play. She says that she tried to blow in his mouth but nothing happened and that she didn't know how to do CPR. 
Marissa then breaks down and she really starts to cry. But I'm not sure whether this is because of Benson or her realisation of the consequences of her actions. Yeah. Yeah. So with this confession, Marissa was arrested and would be eventually sentenced to 37 years in prison for the murder of Benson and another three years for her earlier charges of the baby girl that was hurt in her care also. That's it. 37 years. Not life? Uh, Like life life? Yeah. Well, it's no. And I don't know if it's because like the way that like murder charges work, it's not like a premeditated murder. I don't know. Like, it, she didn't mean to kill him, but she did, and then she tried to cover it up. Like It's a baby. You throw a baby, you think they're going to die. I don't think her intent was to kill him, just, but yeah. obviously... But no matter how frustrated you no, are a baby, course not. you ain't going to throw a of baby. Of course not. And she's obviously, like, this is, like, a history yeah. with her. She's abusive, but... Anyway, I'm not sure how it works. She got 37 years in prison for that, three years for the other girl, so 40 years, and then it's, like, 50-something years, like, parole or whatever if she gets out. Yeah. I'm not sure. So... How old was she when this happened? She was 28. Yeah. Yeah. So, Marissa Tietzort faced significant legal consequences for her actions. She was charged with first degree intentional homicide and child neglect and sentenced to 37 years in prison. Additional three years for the abuse of the 11-month-old girl a few months earlier to Benson's death. Mm Mm-hmm. The community's response to this case has been profound and varied. The tragic death of an innocent child has deeply impacted the public, evoking strong emotions and raising concerns about child abuse and neglect. Many individuals within the community have expressed shock, sorrow and outrage at the senseless loss of life and the horrific circumstances surrounding Benson's death. This case has sparked widespread discussions and debates about the importance of protecting children and addressing issues related to child abuse. It has served as a stark reminder of the need for vigilance and action to prevent such tragedies from occurring in the future. The community has come together to advocate for stronger measures to safeguard children and provide support for families in need. But the question has been raised on whether or not Benson's death could have been prevented if the proper background checks had been done. Mm. I want to talk about this and be sensitive with my approach because Benson's death is absolutely no one's fault but Marissa's. However, a simple background check would have shown absolutely anyone what kind of person Marissa was. This is what I was able to find out about Marissa, someone I don't know. You know, she's in jail in America. I'm all the way in Australia, but this information was accessible to me. These are all of the times Marissa has been to court since 2010 and what for. So, in 2010, her boyfriend Adam took her to court for a paternity test. The one that she was with, that was with her that whole time. Adam, yes. Then again, that same year, Adam took her to court for child abuse and a restraining order. The court grants an injunction, but says that there may be contact under certain conditions. In 2012, Adam takes Marissa to court again for another paternity test on the second child In 2013, Marissa is taken to small claims court by her landlord for eviction and failure to pay rent. In 2014, Marissa was found guilty of receiving or concealing stolen property. Then again, in 2014, Marissa was found guilty of bail jumping and a misdemeanor. And possession of controlled substance. Another misdemeanor she got for that. In the same year, so we're still in 2014, she was charged for resisting or obstructing an officer and bail jumping again. So here's where she gets sentenced to 60 days in jail. Whoa. She also gets probation after this, but essentially 60 days in jail is where we're at for the current charges. Yeah. A few months later, she's back in court again for another small claims hearing regarding unpaid rent and eviction. Her yeah. boyfriend Adam is involved in this too. We're back again for the same thing in 2015, small claims eviction, unpaid rent. In 2016, same thing again, small claims eviction, unpaid rent. In 2018, this would be where Marissa was found guilty of the following charges in this case. Child abuse, intentionally causing harm Mm -hmm. for the young girl. This is where she's ordered to have no contact with children under the age of 18 without agent approval and absolutely no childcare or care to vulnerable adults. And this all happens while she's babysitting Benson. Because remember, like, she texts Heather and says, don't tell anyone because this news source has just posted about my charge. And then, obviously, 2018, she's 
babysitting Benton, and yeah. in 2019, she would then be charged with first degree reckless homicide, which is, of course, for the murder of Benton. Yeah. So I found all of that out by accessing court documents online. What? And just me. Like, hey. I didn't get that from a source. I, like, went onto the court documents and just read the transcripts. Yeah. And that was just, like, a quick check with her name. I didn't need any details, just her name. So... It's very clear that she was not a fit mother and certainly not fit to watch other people's children. And it's just so unfortunate Hell that because no. something like yeah. a simple check was overlooked, not only were multiple children abused in her care, but a baby was murdered and died. Yeah. So Marissa is sentenced to 40 years in prison for Benson murder and the abuse of previous child and care, which we know at the sentencing here at the sentencing hearing, Benson's mother, Heather, and Father Jamie, along with other family members, wore T-shirts with Benson's picture on them with the words, Justice for Benson. Mm. Benson's funeral was held on the 28th of October, 2018. He was surrounded by loved ones who said their final goodbyes before his coffin was lowered into the earth and showered with yellow and white, white roses. Yeah. His mother, Heather, often thinks about him and what could have been, what his first words would be and where he would take his first steps. She continuously thinks of Benson and although his time on earth was short, the memory of him would live on forever. And that was the case of Benson Zion. <laughs> oh man, that's sad. It was really sad. I mean, don't, yeah, don't, don't tell me kids once. I hate the kids ones. Oh, you got a little tear in your eye. Yeah, I don't want to hear that. That's, and, that's terrible. It's hard to imagine, like... Mm. You forget how small a two-month-old baby is. Yeah. Like, it's so tiny. And just, like, mm. how, could, how could you be that frustrated? And I didn't put it in here, but it I know, I don't know why I didn't write it down. And you'll probably get really mad at this, but the autopsy showed that Benson had died somewhere around 4 o'clock to 4.30. So she'd only had him... True. For half an hour to an hour. Oh, man. So before so she so. was frustrated enough that she threw him yeah. into the pack and play. Um, and yeah, crazy. Yeah. Which is why he was stiff when Heather pulled him out. Cause like, yeah. yeah. But I don't know. It's dead. fucking, yeah, background checks. Like I just, I, I don't know. I could not leave my kid anywhere else except for with a family member or a proper daycare, you know, not just someone you've met. Mm-hmm. I don't know, it's all, it's, but yeah, it's, it's sad. It is really sad. I hope old love gets what she deserves in prison. She is very much hated, I can tell you that now. Good. She's known as the killer babysitter. Good. But she's a bit of a hoe in prison, I heard, I read. She like has pen pals and like promises them like sex after she gets out in exchange for like money and things like that. Like She's going to be like 60 something when she gets out. No, 30. She's just basically 70. very manipulative. Yeah. She's a manipulative person and a liar. Fuck. So, anyway, but I don't want to talk about her. Yeah, fuck, she won't fuck be her. Kind of trash. Oh, sorry, yeah, I didn't have much to say that one. I yeah, just you were a bit I don't quiet. like. I don't like. You know, I don't. I don't like it unless it's a fi- survivor story. I know, but this is a murder podcast, and they're not always going to. But I just I shared that one because I just wanted to share like light on Benson's. Yeah. Short. Life, you know, in the two months is very short, so mm, it was more for them. Like, there's a big page on Facebook for like justice for Benson, so I felt yeah. like this was just like letting their voice be heard, mm-hmm. and hopefully, like, it helps them in a positive way, yeah. And yeah, but that was today's case, a very sad one. And thank you guys for listening again. We appreciate any follows and likes and five star reviews, it's very helpful. And we will be back next week with another episode. Tell me next week. Bye, darlings.